Um, today we're going to talk about accidents um, happen and what pet owners can do to try and help their pets before they arrive at the veterinarian's office. And I feel like this is a common question that I get asked as a veterinary professional um, and as well as just a fellow pet owner, you know, things can happen quickly and you always are like, what can I do to help? Um, even if it may not be a lot, you want to know what you can do to try and make the situation as, as good as you can, so to speak. So, there we go. Um, so our outline for today is um, to know where to get help. Um, some community resources that can also help you to develop um, tricks and tips and tools. And then the kind of three things we're going to talk about have a little bit more of a summer slant to them going into the summer season. But we're going to talk about trauma cases, toxin exposure, and heat stroke cases. So the first thing is to have a plan. Um, it's always hard if you're traveling because you may not be familiar with the area, but certainly at least in your home base, wherever your hometown is, um, know what your emergency options are um, before you have an emergency. Just like you know to dial 911 if you have a family member who needs help, who do you call if your pet family member has help? Um, and one way you can find that is certainly by looking in, you know, Google Maps or um, in a telephone book, but you can also just ask your regular veterinarian who they recommend. And if you find yourself in an emergency situation and you haven't made plans ahead of time, that's also a really good first step. Most veterinarians will have um, a recording after hours that will tell you, you know, hey, in such and such situation, call this number or go to this facility um, for further assistance. If you're traveling, same sort of advice. Call any local veterinarian in the, in the area. And again, even if they're not open, a lot of times they'll have a recording to try and give you some information um, about what uh, options are available. There's also websites like vetlocator.com, Google Maps, things like that. Um, those, those websites have um, differing degrees of how accurate they are at any one time, but there are tools that might be helpful. The one thing I want to stress is that you don't want to contact human emergency services um, for a variety of reasons. One is, unfortunately, they're not going to be able to help you. Um, it's actually a law in most states and towns that um, human emergency medical people cannot assist with pets. Um, or if they can, it has to be after all um, humans have been um, treated and helped, which makes sense. Um, but we also don't want to burden their system to, that would might prevent people from getting help who need it. As far as other community resources, um, the American Red Cross actually has dog and cat first um, aid training. Um, I believe there are in-person as well as online training courses. And so you can take something like that. Um, there's also, I just learned this today, but uh, they also offer a, a pet um, first aid app. I haven't personally used um, this particular app, but most of the stuff put out by the, the Red Cross is pretty sound and good, so that might be something you could look into. Um, what about CPR training? I get asked this question a lot, you know, if my dog or cat collapses, what can I do? And unfortunately, um, the answer is not much, um, other than transport them to medical care as quickly as possible. Um, we know that uh, while there are some online training courses, most of them aren't unfortunately um, that well based in science. Um, and so some of them are not very helpful, some of them are incorrect. So there is a large difference in quality. Um, you know, it's not like human CPR training where, you know, everything is certified by like the American Heart Association or the American Red Cross, um, where, you know, you have a consistent sort of message being disseminated. Um, so a lot of these are just created by various people and, and some of them are good and some of them unfortunately are less good. Um, but unfortunately, transporting them to the nearest medical facility is the most important thing you can do if you think your pet needs CPR. Um, we know in humans, out of hospital survival rates globally are unfortunately pretty low um, and they're even worse for pets. So um, I always like to say, you know, there's always a chance um, but I, I wouldn't um, encourage most people to, to learn CPR um, because I'd rather have you spending that time transporting your animal to a facility where they can um, provide more advanced care options. Dr. Blong, do you have a PowerPoint that you're sharing? Yes. Okay, we can't see it. Oh, well that would be unfortunate then. <laughs> Let me troubleshoot. 
Um, okay. Let's see. I bet. Oh, yep. I had to reshare. Sorry. How's that? Better? Yes, perfect. Okay, wonderful. Progress. Um, okay. So let's see. All right. So outline um, plans. Here's the community resources that I mentioned. So um, American Red Cross has a, the first aid online training, and then they also have their pet first aid app that you can download onto your phone. Um, and then we were going to move on to trauma, I think is where we left off. So trauma is one of the most common reasons that we see animals presenting on an emergency basis. Um, and trauma comes in many forms. Really trauma just means any physical injury. So whether that's, you know, um, they're running around outside and um, hurt their leg, or they were hit by a car, um, they were attacked by another dog, or they ran into something outside and have a penetrating injury, um, cuts, broken bones, um, you know, torn knee ligaments, anything like that is all considered trauma. And that, like I said, that's one of the more common reasons we see pets. So what can you do about trauma when it happens to your pet? Well, I realize this might be a little after the fact in some cases, but prevention is always important. Do what you can to prevent it from happening. You know, be aware of your surroundings, make sure your pets are on a leash so that they're not um, able to access the street. Make sure, you know, if you have a gate or a fence, check it periodically to make sure that it's working appropriately, that they haven't dug under the fence or anything like that. But no matter what we do and how careful we are, we can't prevent every accident from happening. And so once an accident does happen, we want to make sure that we um, handle our pets very carefully in these situations because they're scared, they're hurt, um, and, and, and we don't want to make a bad situation worse. We want to make sure that you always, always, always seek veterinary care if your patient has or if your pet has some type of large um, blood force trauma, such as being hit by a car, um, if they suffer any loss of consciousness, um, you know, if they hurt themselves and they're lame for more than you know a short period of time, um, if they have any wounds, um, and then things that you can um, certainly do at home. We'll talk about like how you can address bleeding and things like that. So the first step is how do we handle an injured pet? Because we have to transport them to a veterinary facility to help them, um, but obviously we don't want to hurt them more in the process. Um, and at the end of the day, your safety matters too. When your pet is injured, you are their rescuer. And so your health and safety is also important because if you become injured trying to transport them, then now not only are you injured, but you also then can't help your pet by getting them to the appropriate care that they need. So you have to take care of yourself. Um, pets are afraid, they're nervous, they're painful, and even the nicest dog will bite if you put them, you know, in an extreme enough situation like that. And even though they would never normally bite you under any other situation, um, by the time they get all that adrenaline and pain and everything going on, um, they, they can bite unpredictably. So we always want to be cautious when we, when we handle them, and we especially want to be careful not to, you know, if you think about, um, someone being injured or your pet being injured, you might want to just run right up to them and cuddle them and protect them and try and comfort them. You want to make sure you don't put your face near theirs because it's one thing if you, you know, were to suffer a bite, you know, on a hand or an arm, it's another if you dip it on the face or something like that. So don't, you know, you kind of have to put your own instincts in check a little bit um, and try and avoid doing things like that. And then recruit help. So um, go knock on your neighbor's door, um, ask your partner, your friend, um, whomever to help you um, move your dog or cat um, if they're injured. Um, it's usually less jarring and painful the more people that are helping to make the move. Um, and then also, if you have a bigger animal, um, like a dog, you know, large dog or something, you just need those physical hands, you know. Um, there's a limit to how much you can lift or carry or move um, without that assistance. So don't be afraid to ask for help. So how can we safely transport an injured animal? Well, as I kind of mentioned, one of the big things is we want to prevent biting. Um, and there's a couple ways we can do that. Just taking like a thick, you know, quilt or other blanket or towel and putting it, you know, laying it over the head and neck um, can be a pretty good sort of cushion to prevent biting. We can also place a makeshift muzzle. If you already have a muzzle that's made for a dog, great, you can use that. But if you don't, you can use, you know, anything like a leash, um, a sock. Um, in this picture, we, they're using a, a length of pantyhose, um, which works very well. 
And you can see you kind of just um, make a loop that goes over the muzzle and then you can kind of tie it back behind the head, behind the ears. Um, when you go to pick up an injured animal, um, we usually say use something like a hug hold. Um, and if on the previous slide, they kind of have how you do that with two people and a bigger dog. But the point is that you're gonna kind of basically take one arm and put it um, over their neck so you can kind of squeeze their head and neck up against you. And then your other arm can kind of go under their belly and then you can kind of lift them straight up. Um, That'll usually be the most comfortable way to pick them up, depending upon exactly what their injuries are, but it works in the vast majority of situations. Um, if you do end up having to put a muzzle or a blanket over the pet to move them into the car, I recommend removing that once you get into the car. And then when you get to the veterinary clinic, let the staff know and they'll be happy to help um, get your pet out of the car and they can put on a muzzle or whatever if they need to again. Um, we don't want to leave that muzzle or blanket on them in case they're having any difficulty breathing or anything like that. We don't want to make that situation worse, but also we want to keep safety in mind. Um, if your pet is not able to walk following um, some sort of trauma, then we also kind of get a little worried about could there be something wrong with their back? It's not an absolute guarantee that that's the case, but we want to keep that potential issue in mind when we go to move them and handle them. And if it is possible, if you have something like a, a piece of board or the top of a um, storage tote or some other firm surface that you can use to transport them, if they'll you know, lay or sit on that, then that's preferred because we don't want to jostle or jar their back if they already have a back injury. If um, your pet is bleeding following a trauma event, um, then we want to try and address that. So, you know, a few drops of blood here or there is probably not, not life threatening, you know, like scrapes and stuff like that are common following trauma. But if you feel like there's significant bleeding, we want to try and address that. And kind of the, the ways that we do that is to apply firm direct pressure. Again, keep in mind from what we talked about on the previous slide, your pet may be very painful, so you may want to make sure that you either have someone else to help you or um, place a temporary muzzle or something until you can, can get things, um, you know, bandaged or whatever. We're going to apply an absorbent layer um, to kind of help sort of sop up any blood that does um, seep out. And then we're going to secure it with something um, to try and keep that absorbent layer on there so that, again, it's great for you to hold pressure, but what I really need you to do is you know, get your pet in the car so you can bring them for further care. Um, and so we want to try and um, limit blood loss, but we also want to keep in mind that our ultimate goal is always to proceed towards veterinary care where we can get definitive therapy performed. So um, a lot of times you may not have, right, you might be out at a park, you might not be home, you might not have supplies. So sometimes you have to get a little creative about things. And so there's lots of things we can use for absor absorbent layers, towels, maxi pads, baby diapers. Those are all things that a lot of people have in their house somewhere or in their car or in their purse that they could use to, you know, sort of make a makeshift bandage. Um, same thing when you go to secure it. You could use a sock, you can use pantyhose, you can use tape. Um, just because you don't have a full first aid kit sitting in the trunk of your car doesn't mean you can't potentially provide significant first aid to your pet um, if they need it. And a question, another question we get asked a lot is, does my pet need to see the vet? So, you know, maybe my dog just got hit by a car, um, and, but he's up walking around now and he seems like he's okay. Do I need to take him to a veterinarian um, to get checked out? Um, and the answer that I usually give people is, you know, what would you do for you? Um, I mean, heaven forbid I get hit by a car, but if I did, um, even if I was able to walk around and stuff, I would still go get checked out by the doctor. Um, and if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think everyone's kind of had that saying, you know, you have a, you do a hard exercise or something like that. And the next day you're like, oh man, I feel like I got hit by a bus. Well, people say that for a reason, because even if you don't have broken bones, even if you don't have severe life-threatening injuries, that hurts. There's a lot of soft tissue trauma that happens, and that can be as painful, if not more painful, than broken bones and stuff like that. So we want to make sure that we get our pets some medications to keep comfortable at the minimum. Um, and many injuries are not immediately apparent. Um, you know, an animal or a person can look initially okay following trauma. They have a lot of adrenaline going through them that will temporarily make them seem better than they actually are. 
Um, and so things like internal bleeding or potentially um, lung issues can be hidden for a period of time um, or get worse over time. And so we know that those things are common, like for example, um, bruising of the lung tissue um, is very common following blood force trauma like road accidents. Um, it initially, you know, just like you bruise your arm, right? Today, if I'm walking around and I bang my arm on my desk, I'm like, oh, that hurts. And maybe there's a little mark or something, but the next day, right, it's like this big purple thing. Um, so we know bruising tends to get worse with time. Um, at least in the short term. So all the more reason that you should seek veterinary care after any type of serious trauma event. And with puncture wounds, like dog bites in particular, um, they're sort of the tip of the iceberg, right? So you see a little hole on the external surface, but the deeper tissue has been severely damaged and injured. And you're not gonna know that by just looking at the wound to know whether or not it's severe. We also have secondary complications like infection and things like that that are a potential concern. Um, and so we want to make sure that we get wounds um, evaluated um, as well in all cases. So we're going to kind of move on from uh, trauma situations and talk a little bit about um, potential toxin exposure, which unfortunately is another relatively common reason that we see um, pets in the emergency room. There's a lot of toxin resources available to you um, as owners, um, even if you're not, uh, as I said, a, a veterinarian. So there's animal poison control centers. The two big ones are the ASPCA Animal Poison Control and the Pet Poison Helpline. And both of those are very easy to find. If you just type them into Google, they'll come up with phone numbers. They're both for fee services. So there is a small cost associated with um, calling and consulting, but they have veterinary toxicologists on staff 24 seven. And so, um, you know, for common veterinary medicines, um, a lot of times you can just go to the vet, they know what it is. But if you're not sure if this is gonna be a problem or for some of the human medications that we may not use in dogs and cats as often, um, they have a lot more information about, is this a problem? And if it is, what do you need to do about it? How urgent is it? Um, and the nice thing with both of these services is if you end up calling and they say, oh yeah, this is a concern, we need to get to a vet. Um, the veterinarian that you take your pet to can also call in and say, hey, um, you know, here's the case number, here's the pet, and they'll actually give them um, any necessary treatment recommendations. So it's a really valuable service that I highly recommend to other veterinarians, to owners, um, anyone who has any questions about um, toxin issues. The ASPCA also has a website where you can look up just about any plant you can possibly imagine by it's either common or scientific name, and it'll tell you if that plant is toxic or non-toxic, and if it is toxic to what species, and you know, is it just mild signs like drooling, or is it more concerning um, and potentially life-threatening? So that's really helpful. The only downside is you have to know the name of the plant you're working with, otherwise you can't really look it up. Um, and the other thing is that the ASPCA has this mobile app, which I have used, which is pretty cool. Um, it's available for Apple or Android. And so um, they have all different kinds of toxin information um, about a variety of things, everything from you know, household things to foods to plants, all that kind of stuff. And again, it can kind of tell you like, oh, you know, one pill is probably not a big deal, but if they eat the whole bottle, you need to get help or whatever. And it kind of tells you mild, moderate, severe, um, the problem is, and that's free. General toxin tips though, um, we don't want to induce vomiting unless you're directed to do so by either a poison control center or a veterinarian. There are some toxins that um, it's actually harmful to induce emesis in um, or vomiting. Um, and uh, there are certain ways to induce vomiting that are um, relatively safe and there are others that are potentially harmful. So. We don't want you to just, you know, um, again, make sure you get information, don't just run around um, and induce vomiting um, without knowing um, whether that's a safe option or not for your pet. Um, another really important thing is don't wait for symptoms before asking for help. 100% um, understand and admit, we don't always know when our pets get into something they shouldn't have. Um, but if we do know they get into some, something, Rather than waiting, you know, for signs to develop, which can potentially can take days before they will show up, um, ask about it before you notice symptoms, um, so you know if it's a problem. A lot of toxins um, or potential toxins can be, um, there may not be an antidote, but we can at least sort of decontaminate for them. 
and minimize the chances that they're going to get sick. It's much harder to treat things once they're symptomatic um, and they actually have problems um, because at that point it may or may not be fixable, so to speak. No common household toxins for whatever type of pets you have. So if you have birds, dogs, cats, reptiles, ferrets, whatever, um, no common household toxins for them. Um, so for example, if you have cat, you probably want to know that lilies are um, very toxic to cats. The petals, the um, leaves, the stems, all of it. Um, and so you probably don't want to keep lilies in your house if you have cats. But if you have a dog, then it doesn't matter to you whether or not you have lilies because it's only toxic to cats. Um, and again, the ASPCA poison control website actually has a lot of information about common toxins for um, dogs and cats. Obviously things like medications and stuff like that, um, we always want to make sure we're giving as directed because all of those can potentially cause problems if they're administered incorrectly or if they, you know, get a hold of the whole bottle and eat them, something like that. Going into summer, a question we get asked about a lot is lawn products. Um, so I just wanted to put a little note in there that Lawn products that are applied to the lawn um, and are dry and applied as per directions are almost universally safe, um, which makes sense, right? If it's safe enough for you to walk around barefoot on the, the grass, it's probably okay for your dog to walk around there um, as well. Um, if they get into the concentrated product, um, that could potentially be a problem. Um, so that would be more concerning. That would be something I would call about. But again, uh, if it's a normal applied product, um, it's probably okay. Our final little topic for the day is going to be heat stroke before we go into questions. And so um, when, with heat stroke, like with most things, um, prevention and attention to detail are so important with this. Um, just like people, animals acclimate to changes in the seasons with time, right? So the first, you know, really hot day of the summer is not the day to go and start a new exercise program, right? Because both you and your dog are going to be very sorry about it later. Um, we always want to make sure they have access uh, to um, shade and water as well. Um, and then, uh, especially if they're out exercising, make sure you take a little um, portable water dish with you for them to have. Um, and then make sure you take rests periodically. It's good for you, it's good for your dog. And then listen to your pet, right? So, um, you know, if they are if you're playing with the chuck it out in the yard um, with your dog um, and, you know, he's really gung ho for the first 15 minutes and then he's kind of starting to slow down and maybe he's not so quick about bringing the ball back, like maybe it's time to take a break or rest. Um, same thing if you're out on a walk or a hike, um, you know, they're usually 10 miles in front of you, but if they're starting to lag behind or you're having to drag them along, it's probably time to take a rest. And then if you have a significant exercise that you're going to partake in, like a race, um, or you're going to be doing, you know, really long distance running or things like that, um, you want to make sure that you try and plan that with the weather accordingly. So you want to either do those activities usually first thing in the night, or I'm sorry, first thing in the morning, or kind of last thing at the end of the day when the sun's not as intense, it's a little bit cooler outside. Um, and just be aware of your pet's overall limitations, right? This little English bulldog guy, like he can't breathe normally on the best day of the year. So he probably isn't really um, very built to go out on a five mile run in the middle of summer. This guy is probably like gung ho running like a maniac, you know, 17 hours a day. Um, so he's probably gonna tolerate exercise a little better. Um, it looks like we have a, a uh, question about lawn products. And the question is, um, what if the dog eats the grass after the product has dried? Um, that is also uh, something that is usually um, very safe. Once the products have been applied to the lawn and they've dried, it's usually not an issue for them to eat the grass. Um, they can't really usually eat enough grass to actually um, result in a, a toxicity or problem. So those are also very safe when they eat the grass after a product on it. All right, so back to heat stroke. Um, symptoms of heat stroke or heat stress or potentially impending heat stroke include things like weakness, collapse, heavy panting, um, and not just like panting, excited, but really just heavy, almost frantic panting, um, drooling a lot because um, they're trying to keep their mouth moist so that they can um, dissipate heat, and then sort of acting dazed or confused or potentially becoming unresponsive if it's severe enough. 
The two big things as far as um, caring for a pet who may have suffered heat stroke is really important that they get to a center for care as rapidly as possible. Um, we know that both in human and animal studies, there is a significant relationship between the delay between getting appropriate medical care and outcome, and then also cooling. So I don't want you people to um, take a lot of time to cool them. Like if I had a pet that collapsed out in a field, I wouldn't first drive home and give them a bath and then take them to the veterinarian's office. But I would take my bottle of water and that I had with me out on my hike and I would pour that all over my dog. And then I would throw them in the car and crank up the AC um, all the way to the vet's office. So anything you can do to try and cool them off, a hose, um, uh, a bathtub, a pool, a water bottle, um, anything like that, and then rapidly transporting them for further care is really important as well. So as we've kind of said throughout this, prevention is key for most things, although we can't prevent, present ever, or I'm sorry, prevent every accident from happening, um, but we want to make sure we keep uh, track of things um, and prevent the things we can and pay attention. So with that, I want to thank you all for attending. I would be happy to um, ask, answer any questions that people have. Um, it looks like, oh, here's a question. Um, so the question is, I had a foreign body dog first aid post about not packing a wound in the neck area. Um, so for uh, if a dog had a wound um, in the neck area, um, I guess I, I think it means a little bit on what you mean about pack. I think it's fair to put something on it to try and absorb, um, you know, any significant blood. But then, you know, the thing about the neck is we don't want to wrap it really tightly um, because we don't want to impair the airway or anything like that. So I guess my advice would be in a situation if I had a significant um, neck wound would be to apply some type of absorbent thing and then maybe loosely wrap it with a towel, or if you have a friend with you, you know, they can gently apply pressure to the area, um, but I would not want to, you know, like a limb or something, I would wrap that pretty tightly and be okay with that. But we, that wouldn't be something we would want to do um, with a, with a neck wound. It would be wrapped it very tightly, tightly sorry. Um, the next question is, my dog once collapsed from heat exhaustion, but perked up immediately with water and a cool cough. Is it a, okay to not seek veterinary care if the dog bounces back. Um, there are certainly different um, degrees of heat, ex heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Um, in large part though, if you get to the point where your dog collapses, I would strongly advise veterinary care. Um, again, it's sort of like, um, you know, the, the trauma cases. Um, a lot of these dogs with heat stroke um, have significant circulatory collapse. And so sometimes in a few cases, cooling alone may be enough, but a lot of times they also need aggressive resuscitation with IV fluids. They can have a lot of complications like bleeding issues, infection, um, organ failures, things like that. So if it's to the point where your dog has collapsed, um, I would strongly advise um, seeking uh, veterinary care. Um, okay, another question is, what about trauma? For example, a car accident. If I suspect um, fractures or internal damage, how do I carry the animal to the clinic? And that's a really good question. Um, for most fractures and stuff, I don't recommend that people apply splints out in the field um, because without knowing where the fracture is, a splint can actually potentially be more harmful than helpful. Um, and again, ideally, um, we're transporting them to further care where they can get a splint um, placed. And so um, that kind of hug hold that we talked about with one hand kind of under the belly, one in front of the neck, um, is really a good um, uh, is a really good thing to use. And the nice thing is if there is a fracture of a limb or something, you're not really putting a lot of stress or pull on those limbs. So usually, again, it's about as comfortable as you can get for carrying an animal with a fracture. The other thing is when I put them in the car, I let them decide how they want to lay or sit or whatever, because they're usually gonna put themselves in the most comfortable position. So for example, if the dog's not comfortable sitting down, if they keep trying to sit up on their bottom instead of like laying down in the car, then I would let them do that because that's probably, they're probably doing it because they're more comfortable that way. 
Um, but that hug hold we kind of talked about is usually the best way to transport, even in the face of broken bones and wounds. Um, another question we have is, is there a good resource or rule of thumb to know how much chocolate consumed requires veterinary care? Um, and that's also a really good question. So there is, um, on that um, APCC, the Animal Poison Control Center um, phone app that I told you, I believe they have a chocolate toxicity calculator on there. Um, you have to know how much chocolate they ate and how, what kind of chocolate is. So for example, baking chocolate is a lot more dangerous than something like milk chocolate. Um, and you also have to know how much. So if my pet eats a two ounce Snickers bar, that's awesome, but most of that's not chocolate, right? So sometimes those um, tools are easy to use, sometimes less easy, um, but they're a good sort of starting point. If you're gonna use one of those tools, we also always recommend that you um, sort of assume worst case scenario, right? So if I use that Snickers bar example, if my pet eats a two ounce bar of Snickers, I know Snickers is milk chocolate, so that's one question. But then the other thing is how much of it is chocolate? And so, you know, I might just assume like, okay, I'll assume 50% of that two ounces was chocolate, which is probably an overestimation, but with toxicities, we always assume worst case scenario. And so um, I know there's one, like I said, on the animal poison control app for your phone. Um, I know that like uh, if, if for any of you listening who are fourth year students or students in the clinics, we have um, like Excel spreadsheets uh, that have a chocolate toxicity cal uh, calculator built into it that you can, um, if you email me, I'm happy to send that to you. Um, those are the only, those are the best resources that I would say that I know of as far as trying to calculate, is this a toxic dose or not? And you can also, like I said, always call Animal Poison Control or potentially your veterinarian's office. 